our program. Welcome. And the dynamics of the seminar are very simple. You have as much time as you want uh, uh, to make your presentation. Then we will open to the audience uh, in order to, to make questions or something like that. Um, and em segundo lugar, eu queria agradecer aos que estão aqui presentes e agradecer às agências de fomento como CAPES, é, FAPEMIG, CNPq, que permitem que esse espaço ocorra. É, professor Young Gu é professor visitante no Center for Analysis of Social Ex Exclusion e associado no Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, ambos na London School of Economics and Political Science. É, até 2009, ele foi professor de política social na Universidade de Bath, é, onde agora é professor emérito. Mas a sua obra é bastante vasta e engloba três grandes áreas, necessidades humanas e bem-estar, economia política do estado de bem-estar social e regimes de bem-estar e política social em países em desenvolvimento. Mas antes de chegar, isso tudo antes de chegar às mudanças climáticas. Ele tem livros como The Political Economy of the Welfare State, que já está na sua 14ª edição, traduzido para espanhol, italiano, sueco, coreano, chinês e japonês. É, o livro... É, a teoria da necessidade humana, ganhador de dois prêmios, é, prêmio Deutsche e Mirdal Price, em 1992, é, Insecurity and Welfare Regimes in Asia, Africa and Latin America, que sem dúvida é uma referência no debate de welfare regimes, é, entre é, muitos outros que são referências na área. No entanto, compreendendo a ameaça iminente do aquecimento global e os limites ambientais para todos os aspectos do bem-estar humano, ele decidiu mudar de foco na sua pesquisa e estudar as mudanças climáticas, tanto do ponto de vista moral quanto de perspectivas da economia é, e da economia política. Na última década, tem pesquisado as dimensões sociais da mudança climática, os impactos da desigualdade e do crescimento capitalista no aquecimento global, como as necessidades humanas universais ainda podem ser satisfeitas e como a política ecossocial pode salvaguardar o bem-estar sustentável. E o resultado dessa pesquisa foi o livro de 2017, Heat, Greed and Human Need, Climate Change, Capitalism and Sustainable Well-being. Thank you, Professor Yan, and please make yourself comfortable. Thank you, Moran. Well, thank you, Natalia, for that uh, introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Um, and it's, it's good to link up with Brazil again. Um, I was there last, I think, eight years ago, seven, eight, and also ten years ago. And then it was a, a very optimistic country. And it's uh, sad to see uh, that that is not the case now, not just because of COVID, because, but because of political changes and, and other changes. Um, but uh, this is a talk I gave at Oxford University last week. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it, but um, I'm anxious to leave time for discussion so we can see how this relates to the, how my analysis relates to the situation in Brazil. Um, how do I shift this? Oh yeah. So, uh, clearly I come at it, you, you've given the introduction from social policy. That's my, that's been my field of study all my life. Um, but for the last 13 years or so, I've been studying climate change. And the question is how we relate these two things together. We, we're in the situation of the Anthropocene, where human activity is having a significant impact on the planet's geology, climate, ecosystems. And we are, of course, part of the ecosystem. So we're in a completely new phase of uh, development. Um, Uh, so the question is, welfare states, how do they react and adjust to this? My very brief 
definition of a welfare state is a redistribution of resources, incomes and services to achieve more equitable and humane social outcomes. That's probably not the best definition, but that's what we're talking about. And so at present, I see a lot of social policy thinking and research and teaching is uh, myopic. It's, it's not looking ahead to the, um, to the way in which environmental and ecological change alters the nature of social policy and welfare states. So that's what I want to talk about. Um, so this is the one of the latest pictures of rising temperatures over the last 130 years. Um, anything here which is yellow or orange or red uh, marks um, an increase in global temperatures on land. Uh, and um, it, everywhere this is the case, but it, it particularly noticeable here is the rise in temperature in the Arctic zone, um, which is quite remarkable. Um, so average global land temperatures now are 1.1 degrees above the 19th century level. The safe zone, which has been agreed um, by the UN and the um, Climate Committee, is uh, 1.5 degrees. So we're already more than two thirds of the way towards that limit. But the current projections, if we carry on as we are, is, uh, is about three degrees warming. And three degrees warming is cataclysmic. Um, and the IPCC has warned about the irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems if we continue to that sort of temperature. Um, but I mean, just to illustrate, so one way, the issue is not so much emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but the total stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that gives you the available carbon budget, which the IPCC says is now about 420 gigatons or billion tons of carbon. Um, and that's just to give us a two-thirds chance of remaining within this temperature. I'm not going to go into any of the figures anymore, but just to note that the, if the British share of that total carbon budget would be 2.9 billion tonnes. But our current consumption-based emissions in Britain are 590, nearly 600 million tonnes a year. So dividing that, you see that we, if we carry on at the present, we only have in Britain five years of emissions left uh, at that level. So, um, but Britain's a rich country. So inequality and sustainability are inextricably linked together when we talk about climate change. Um, and this is the background for thinking about social policy and climate change and especially for rethinking welfare states in rich countries. Now, a good place to start is Kate Rowell's um, donut diagram. I guess your students and you are, are, are aware of Kate Rowell's an analysis. Um, I think it's a, a very good visualisation of the system for the problems we face. She has on the outside the ecological ceiling and she's got here nine planetary limits defined by the Stockholm Institute and there are nine of them and I'm only looking at um, this one at the top here, uh, climate change, but there are others, uh, pollution, diversity loss, fresh water, ocean acidification and so forth. Um, and it's important that we don't breach those limits uh, in the future. But then she also looks at the social foundations um, uh, and what's necessary to bring everyone on, on the planet up to a decent level of living um, in terms of water and food and energy and housing, but also the prerequisites of this um, equality 
political voice, income and work, and so on. Uh, these uh, lower, these foundations are derived on the whole from the Sustainable Development Goals agreed by the United Nations five years ago. So, she says, we, we need to stay in the safe and just space for humanity, which is to bring everyone up to the social foundation, but not to exceed the ecological ceiling. That's the task which we, which we face. And of course, the situation is very different across the world, and um, here's a remarkable sort of visualization of this by the, um, a group of researchers at Leeds University in the UK. Um, and this illustrates the, the impact of, in, of uh, inequality uh, layered on climate change. Um, where we need to get, well, well let me start with, if we look at India, we see that um, very few um, of the planetary limits are breached uh, in, in India. Only one, according to the research of, of the Leeds group. But on the other hand, um, very few social thresholds are achieved. The, 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 the red areas inside here illustrate uh, the great extent of unmet needs in a wide variety of areas in India. If we then turn to the other extreme, the, uh, the EU 28 members, the rich countries, um, you see here that uh, five areas of pl five planetary boundaries are being exceeded, according to the Leeds research. Um, most of the social foundations are met in Europe, so pe people, there's little shortfall here, but the opposite is the case in planetary boundaries, these are being exceeded. Um, six or seven. Uh, planetary boundaries transgressed, but nine or ten social thresholds achieved. Um, then in between there's, there's China, uh, and they estimate here that uh, the, there are fewer social foundations, uh, th social thresholds achieved, uh, but fewer so social foundations transgressed. I imagine that um, Brazil is, is rather similar to China here, but the pattern. I haven't checked that out. Um, if you go onto their website, you can get this for every country in the world, including, including Brazil. So um, the goal, of course, is to get up to the top uh, left-hand corner, where you have a large number of social thresholds achieved. Basic needs are being met in a wide variety of areas, but the, no biophysical boundaries are crossed. Planetary boundaries are safe. That's the goal. So th well, this illustrates that there are different routes to it from different countries according to where they are at the moment. That's, that's important and uh, I think this shows it very well. Okay, so I, I'll be using in, in the rest of this talk the framework I develop in my book Heat, Greed and Human Need which you've mentioned, um, which uh, argues that there are three um, stages of uh, responses to, the, to this dilemma. There are three um, strategies for decarbonizing in rich countries. Um, the, the, the first is, is, is green growth to decouple emissions from output. Uh, this applies to all countries. So you, growth continues, uh, but the emissions from that growth of output and consumption uh, diminish. That's the basic um, strategy of deep coupling emissions from production and consumption. That's the dominant strategy today. Um, I argue that that is, won't be sufficient and that in the rich countries we must also de-recompose consumption. I'll say more about this in a minute. Um, on the route to degrowth, and the ultimate strategy here is to degrow uh, the rich countries in order that other countries can grow. So um, I'll be focusing here on um, on the 
on green growth and on recomposing consumption. I won't be looking at degrowth here uh, and I'll only look at climate change when I'm talking about the, um, uh, the environmental policies. Um, so uh, those are the, th the three strategies which I outline and I organise the book around those. But each of those strategies could be unfair or unjust. It could hurt the, the poor. It could hurt certain areas uh, of groups with little political uh, control. Um, so we have to find a way of marrying together climate justice and social justice. That's necessary for ethical reasons, um, but it's also necessary um, because without that, there will be very little democratic consent for the sort of climate policies we need to see. Without fairness, there can be little or no democratic consent. So for both sort of pragmatic reasons and justice reasons, we need to have fair decarbonisation. So each of those strategies must be fair. There must be fair, first of all, C1, fair eco-efficiency policies to assume that climate policies do not penalise vulnerable groups or worsen the distribution of income and resources. At the least, they should not penalise the worst off, um, but in, uh, preferably they should uh, favour them. So that's fair echo, what I call fair echo efficiency. And then the fair recomposition of consumption we must pursue, it's not fair that um, the necessities uh, which everyone requires are affected and not the luxuries which are consumed by the, the rich. So we need here a consumption corridor between minimum and maximum consumption standards, drawing on the distinction between necessities and luxuries. The provision of necessities must be safeguarded, but the uh, existence of luxuries may have to be curbed. And then the uh, fair degrowth means that the biophysical case for degrowth made by clim some climate scientists is not implemented at the expense of the ethico-social case, the, co the, the well-being case for, for, for um, degrowth. Um, so that's the framework that I develop in the book <coughs> and the second half of the book is based around that. So I'm just going to talk about the first two strategies here in this lecture. Um, and the, the fair echo efficiency comes down to this strange um, sort of equation, GND plus UBS the Green New Deal plus universal basic services. So <clears throat> first of all, to talk about the, the Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal is essentially an integrated eco-social program that pursues both welfare and sustainability. It's emerged as a general framework along these lines but in different, um, in different countries and different contexts. Um, it, it's a framework with national variations, the, the British, the, the United States, the EU, and it would be good to talk about uh, this framework in the Brazilian context in the discussion. One of the features of all green growth programmes is that they recognise uh, climate welfare synergies. There are ways in which pursuing climate policy can also pursue welfare policy. Um, air pollution, en energy poverty, nutrition improvements, sustainable livelihoods and also employment. As we shift towards a green economy, um, employment in some areas of the economy uh, clearly uh, fossil fuels will diminish but there are other areas which will grow so there are pluses and minuses here um, so that's a, a, a 
an assumption underlying the Green New Deal approaches wherever they are that there are there are synergies between climate and welfare. Um, another um, position I think is it recognises that climate pricing is reg is regressive. Um, carbon pricing is re is almost always regressive because the big three essentials of of um, people's budgets food housing and transport are all carbon intensive i provide some um, data on this in my book and it was a surprise to me because some luxury items of course uh, many air air flights are regressive but the big three essentials are carbon intensive so if you increase the cost of carbon it will hit poorer families harder almost always and that is a, a basic issue which has to be faced which has to be faced and then a, another i think agreement is that simple compensation programs are problematic and unsustainable um, I mean, the, the usual uh, econ economics argument when you have regressive pricing is okay you compensate the losers you compensate losing families and households and or regions but this is very difficult to do through social policy uh, in when faced with climate policies because the um, the type of housing varies very greatly across communities um, their distance from other amenities and therefore transport costs differ the typical pattern of um, diets and food consumption differ uh, and, and compensating people for rises in these costs is is very difficult probably impossible and also unsustainable because as you increase carbon costs to to um, pull down to, as to move towards net zero economies um, the compensation required will grow over time so um, recognizing synerg synergies recognizing pricing is regressive and recognizing that compensation is very very difficult is the background I think for Green New Deal policies okay um, so the Green New Deal does involve upfront investment in a whole range of, of areas of life um, and very substantial. I point out in here that um, retrofitting housing in Britain to make it uh, less to less um, leak, heat leakages and, and to reduce the carbon footprint down to zero requires re retrofitting 20,000 dwellings every week for 30 years. It's a big investment program. Um, quite a, a good part of this could be from private investment, but public investment would also be needed, especially in housing and transport. Um, the, this is a diagram of the sort of investment program needed in Britain is probably quite similar in other countries. The yellow here is, is mainly in um, uh, renewable fuels, renewable electricity. So a half of it is in that form, but the orange and the red here is the investment in housing, and the purple here is the investment in transport. And those are very big items needed continually up to 2050 in order to move towards uh, a net zero economy. Um, and this has all sorts of implications for fiscal and economic policy, which I don't want to talk about. It's, it's, a, it's quite a complicated issue, but it clearly requires uh, green investment banks uh, and uh, substantial bond uh, funding of uh, public investment. We can talk about that if you want to afterwards. So um, upfront investment is crucial to achieve a Green New Deal. Um, then the other side of this 
is what is a UBS or Universal Basic Services. I've talked there about the climate side, now looking at the, at the social welfare side. Um, I argue, uh, and others do, that increased public service provision will be necessary to meet needs more directly. In other words, in-kind provisioning provision of direct public services as opposed to providing income support and leaving the provisioning to market forces which I regard as the pure UBI approach, the pure universal basic income approach. So we need to strengthen um, existing public provision which is mainly in health and education. That will need to be uh, strengthened but uh, I argue we would need to con extend this sort of approach to other areas, other basic needs such as housing, uh, social care, child care, water, energy and transport. So we, it, it would involve providing entitlements to what I call basic need satisfiers in these areas if we're to do this job properly. Um, so, I mean, two areas where, which are much discussed uh, in Britain today, social care, um, entitlement to adequate, good quality, free or affordable social care is becoming um, more and more urgent in Britain, especially following the pandemic. The National Health Service has had considerable funds devoted to it, but um, social care, especially for elderly and uh, chronically ill people has not. That will need to be addressed. And there are models here in other countries, in Germany, in Scotland and so forth. Another completely different area is, is, is transport. How far will we need to extend bus transport to enable people to um, access jobs and um, services? We have um, a Freedom Pass in the UK, which provides um, free bus travel for people who are over 60. But this is not available to the rest of the population. And that is one possible way of extending direct public provision uh, in the transport area. It would have a very substantial effect and it wouldn't actually cost that much as a share of G GNP. So those are two ways in which you can think about universal basic services extending into new areas. Um, the case for doing this uh, you know, it, it, it is, well, can be made in terms of four goals. Equity, effectiveness, solidarity and sustainability. Um, and the our, there's growing evidence for, um, for these. I'll look at two of these pieces of evidence. This is the equality argument. Um, and this brings together data from the um, OECD. This is an OECD study of um, in-kind benefits as a share of disposable income for households in different quintiles. Uh, and it looks, uh, it brings together education, healthcare, social housing, elderly care and other childcare benefits. And you can see that this amounts to a very substantial in-kind addition to income in the lowest quintile, 76%, but it accounts for much less in the highest quintile, 14%. In other words, providing public services in kind is automatically very redistributive. It accounts for much for a much higher proportion of income in lower income households than in upper income households. So there's an equality argument for services in kind and then there's also I'm discovering um, uh, a carbon argument, a climate and sustainable sustainability argument. <clears throat> this is from a recent study of health carbon footprints per capita. So this is looking um, at um, how 
what's the carbon carbon footprint uh, for providing health care in different countries and what stands out here is that the much higher carbon footprint in the United States compared with these European countries uh, and these European countries all have uh, fairly integrated healthcare, public healthcare systems. The United States uh, does not and relies much more on private uh, provision. Uh, and this is one re result of that in terms of carbon footprints. So the case I think for universal basic services can be made in terms of these goals. Um, it involves a public policy framework it doesn't necessarily involve government direct government provision of these services but a government framework of regulation and standard setting and taxation and subsidies so the argument is that um, this ties in with a, a, the Green New Deal fairly well it provides a social counterpart to the Green New Deal if you like and in terms of Kate Roweth's donut framework, if um, UBS would improve the social foundations, um, but also contribute to reducing um, planetary excess in, in carbon and other areas. So that's the first part of, of the, that's my first strategy. Um, and, and clear, so, so we, we need some form of social guarantee, I would argue. Giving people money to spend on goods and services is a potentially self-defeating route. It's important, of course, there must be the provision of a minimum income, but it must depend also on the reform, uh, a reform delivery of services. Um, and a, a UBI does nothing directly to decarbonize economy. So what I think is required is a guaranteed basic income, but not necessarily paying it out to everyone. A social guarantee then that encompasses both money and in-kind services. Okay, that's the first part of, of my talk. The second part is <clears throat> the argument about recomposing consumption which I spend a couple of chapters of the book on. I argue that this whole eco-efficiency approach is essential but, but inadequate. And this can be illustrated by a scenario put forward by some Swedish economists. Um, it's a scenario for greenhouse gas emissions in Sweden uh, to, the, to the middle of the, this century. I mean, this is pretty simple stuff, but what it's showing is that if you have, if you apply the technology today, then the greenhouse emissions in Sweden from private consumption, this is emissions from private consumption, will continue to rise quite fast. <clears throat> if we can reduce the, if we can improve the echo efficiency, the, the, the decoupling, at historic rates that brings it down to the red line and if we can improve it at a doubled if we can double that yearly echo efficiency rate that brings it down to the blue line but that's probably the maximum we can achieve in um, decoupling but we're still a, a good way off the two de de degree target for um, emissions from private consumption and even further off, if we take 1.5 degrees as the desirable goal. What we need here, they say, is post-material scenarios to, in addition to the, um, the eco-efficiency uh, scenarios. <clears throat> so, um, it's, it's, the first strategy alone won't be enough. We have to do more in in richer countries i'm talking now about richer countries we don't have to we have to tackle um, consumption and inequity and the issue of non-generalizability what do i mean by this i mean we have to look at uh, parts of the consumption of uh, rich countries 
and estimate whether this can be generalised to a world of 8 billion or more people. And clearly that's not the case in some areas. And uh, the story of SUVs is very, important, is very interesting here. The growth of um, sports utility vehicles, big cars, has um, offset all the improvements in, um, in car technology so far. Uh, the uh, emissions per mile driven of cars has been cut down, but the consumer switch to larger and larger cars is offsetting that and is a major contribution now to greenhouse gases um, worldwide. So I argue we need to think about recomposing consumption um, to switch from high to low carbon goods and services. That's the second part of my argument. Uh, and climate science is now recognising this, that we must start thinking about demand when we're, when we're looking at climate policy. Uh, and this is the emphasis on demand side policies, which is now adding to technical supply side policies. So for an example of this, in the transport area, there's the improve, shift, avoid framework has been developed by uh, transport um, people working in the transport field. Improve means you improve the um, emissions uh, from existing vehicles, you switch to electric vehicles in a fast, rapidly. But the shift then um, is what is you shift the, the nature of the, the uh, transport system towards walking, cycling and public transit. And then the avoid uh, stage comes in, you, you re reduce the total amount of transport required through home working, network shopping and so forth. So with this improve shift avoid framework you actually reduce the carbon footprint of the transport system in three ways. And this can be applied to other areas too, such as um, food and housing. And the benefits of this framework, which is now being recognised by the IPCC, the uh, Inter International Panel on Climate Change, is um, that it's effective and it avoids some high-risk scenarios, um, such as uh, bioenergy with car carbon uh, capture and storage. And also this can make a direct improvement to well-being through uh, health, uh, uh, healthy travel. Uh, so that's um, one example in which from the climate side now we're having more and more interest shown in changing demand patterns. Again, I'm saying in the rich world or by the rich in fast developing countries such as Brazil. Now, to do this, um, I think, equitably, uh, means we have to start distinguishing necessities and luxuries. More collective consumption, what I've said about UBS, will help here. But unequal private consumption will remain. And so we need ways of recomposing consumption, uh, which means identifying ceilings to consumption levels. Um, uh, we have here um, Professor Shu in philosophy. It's not equitable to ask some people to surrender necessities so that other people can retain luxuries. And Ingrid Robbins in, in the Netherlands um, argues it's not permissible to have more resources than are needed to fully flourish in life. So as well as flaws, which are necessary, to provide a minimum income, we have to start thinking about maximum income and ceilings. But how can we do this in a democratic welfare state? This is tricky. This is a, a difficult area to broach. We argue in my earlier book, Our Theory of Human Need, that you need a dialogic democracy to bring citizens and experts together to debate these issues. Citizens forums as they're inclusive and empowering. Now this all sounds like 
pie in the sky and utopia. But I'm being struck by the development of citizens assemblies to deal with uh, moving towards net zero or much lower carbon that we've seen now in, in the UK and France uh, and, and Scotland and Ireland and other countries. Uh, and uh, these, I think, do, do illustrate how far we could move uh, in this area. And I'll just give a few examples of the, the French Citizens' Convention um, set up by Macron in France, um, partly in response, of course, to the Gilets Jeunes uh, protests which uh, hit the country beforehand. So you have representative citizens' meetings, 150 representatives, which uh, which represent the the major groups in France, um, tasked to decide policies to achieve a 40% cut in the country's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 in just 10 years' time. That's fast, um, and um, the the government committed to a, to adopt the convention's proposals without changes. We'll see whether that happens. Anyway, the convention agreed on a whole range, 149 proposals, including fast mandatory retrofit of least energy efficient buildings, a ban on high emission vehicles by 2025, which is just four years time now, um, greenhouse gas and carbon labels in retail and consumer in places and advertisements and limiting the use of heating and air conditioning in all buildings. So these um, decisions were agreed unanimously by the 150 uh, citizens representative and included, of course, people who previously um, were opposed to such uh, restrictions due to climate change. So um, I'm now wondering whether the Covid crisis can push this sort of approach forward. I was struck um, by the UK government lit making a list of essential workers early on in the lockdown, very early on, as did other governments. Um, they identified a list of essential workers whose children would be entitled to education when the schools were otherwise shut. And it's interesting that this list goes way beyond health and social care or emergency services. It included farmers, supermarket staff, workers in the utilities, teachers, telecommunications workers, transport workers, workers in law and justice, religious staff, social security staff, and retail banking. Um, and that covers, we, the, the um, IFS has estimated, about 25% of the workers in the UK. So this was a, a sort of very interesting challenge to um, val economic value theory. It's saying that some workers are more essential than others. And then, of course, it was quickly realised that these key workers, on average, were paid less than uh, other workers. So a gap was opening up between market valuation and social valuation. And that seems to be an interesting development uh, in, in my country and in other countries too. So um, can social policy embrace flaws as um, ceilings as well as flaws? Um, that's that's one of the uh, interesting issues. Um, so the, in other words, social policy has for a long time, for, for many decades, identified poverty levels, levels for decent income, minimum uh, uh, consumption levels, which are necessary for people to participate in their society. That's one of the jobs of social policy. But I'm wondering now whether the um, ceilings can also be developed in order to keep total consumption below uh, a safe, uh, within a safe level. So my conclusion is um, 
and I'm stopping now, is uh, four policies for an echo, four proposals for an echo social policy. A social policy that takes the ecological crisis seriously should first of all develop a Green New Deal as an essential framework for a just process of decarbonisation. Secondly, it should extend collective consumption, universal basic services and de develop a social guarantee covering cash and in-kind benefits. Third, it should develop measures to restrain unsustainable private consumption um, in rich countries and amongst the rich in developing countries. And I think here the role of citizens' assemblies uh, would be useful. And fourthly, um, it should protect essential workers that are doing essential tasks in reproducing um, the society we live in and should therefore, and to that end, should revalue labour. Um, oh, that brings me to my end, at the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. You really bring a lot of things to our reflection. And I, I will open, uh, ask the, the audience uh, if they want to do questions. Pessoal, se vocês quiserem fazer questões e perguntas. Um, I would do would like to ask you about, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess my feeling that uh, as the global organization are responding, uh, moving on uh, uh, about this, this, uh, this necessity uh, as quick as the Brazilian uh, institutional, the democratic institution <laughs> are respond to our political crisis. It means that, uh, I don't know uh, about uh, the global organization, but in Brazil, uh, we are seeing in this government, for example, uh, the fires allowed by these governments almost induced and the clearly mistake environment policy become if we if we think about that uh, this this point that you are bringing to us are more essential uh, and i would like to to hear uh, you about two points First, that I guess that you are talking not only about uh, the our present needs and our present wants, but the, also the future generations need also. I would like to to hear you about that. Okay. And the second point is about the uh, global organization. What what they actually are doing uh, to respond to this necessity uh, in the speed that we need. Please. Sorry, sorry, the global organizations. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I've, we are planning to do some, um, some joint research, as, as, as you know, with some, with some researchers in Brazil. Uh, and um, in, in preparing for that, uh, I've just been struck by how difficult the situation is in Brazil. The, the 2016, um, was it an amendment to the constitution which prevents the government spending more um, irrespective of the economic or social situation? Is, am I right in that, that there was an amendment to the constitution? I'm not. I'm not pretty sure about that. Okay. But, but I'm not uh, a good person to talk about uh, okay. this. But I understand that there's a, a downward pressure on um, on government spending, uh, and there certainly is in in Britain too. Um, 
we've had uh, years of austerity and uh, what what I've tried to develop here is is a program to build back better to 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 try and recover from the pandemic in a way which is both socially and environmentally progressive um, and the the situation the political situation is not good for that but on the other hand and i'm not sure about the situation in brazil which seems to be rather unusual um, the the pandemic has illustrated that governments can start putting well-being before the economy i mean across the world there have been very substantial uh, lockdowns and um, uh, policies put in place which have uh, hurt the economy that this suggests that the government can uh, respond to substantial social challenges in this way also the gov governments across the world have borrowed huge sums in order to maintain <coughs> uh, incomes and employment to a certain extent during the pandemic that's a big break with past policies and and they've bro they've broken with uh, austerity policies in order to in increase spending on um, health and social security I, I want to learn whether all this is true or not in the case of brazil but those are all indications that um, that change can come about um, and I've also mentioned the, the way in which essential workers have been prioritised. So these are all examples of a quite a big switch in the orthodox uh, policy framework in the last year. So I'm, um, whilst I'm not starry-eyed, <laughs> um, I'm beginning. I'm beginning to think that yes, there can be um, some, some changes along the lines I've, I've discussed. And I can also talk some more about climate policy changes. Future needs. Yeah, um, yes, the, the, the whole argument of my book is that, um, that we must clearly think about the needs of future generations. I argue that if we have a, a robust theory of human need, we can th think about the needs of future generations. We can compare them with our own needs and we can then devise policies to take the, the, those into those into account um, it, 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 it can it can be done and we and it has to be done because uh, I, I mean that's that's in the very nature of sustainability that we have to think beyond uh, the short term um, so I'm, I'm more optimistic that this can be done you mentioned the international um, governmental organ I'm not I'm not um, a great expert on, on what's happening at the uh, international level but I do know that there's again a major switch developing in the World Bank and the IMF accepting that substantial government investment will be required and accepting that this can involve uh, some substantial uh, government deficits extending over time so uh, the notion of perpetual deficits has now been recognized by the OECD so I'm, I'm also I've got some optimism that there are shifts taking place at the international level as well Luis, você quer fazer questão, por favor? Sim, obrigado Natalia Good afternoon everybody Hi, Professor. It's a Hi. pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure listening to you talk about so uh, difficult issues, but with this tranquility, that's the best. I would like to ask a question about Germany and European Union, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about Germany, energy bundle? Germany going back to coal and Nord Stream pipelines one and two linking Germany to Russia. And would you say when it comes to energy and to renewable energy, Germany has failed with the European Union since Germany used to be 
such a kind of as example, good example for the world and for the European Union when it comes to renewable, uh, renewable energy and huh. how it seems has changed. Huh. Well, it's true that Germany has, um, has uh, traditionally relied on coal quite extensively and with the um, anti-nuclear movement that's knocked out a whole swathe of generating capacity which was previously available, low carbon capacity. Um, and it is um, going to be dependent on Russian gas for some time uh, to come. All, all that is true. But Germany is still um, focused on uh, shifting to a net carbon economy. And I think in many other areas, uh, for example, in, in housing and, and renewable generation, it's, it's quite progressive. So uh, I don't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have such a, such an extreme position on Germany as you seem to be arguing. Does that okay. thank you well come back if you want to <laughs> uh, our graduate students Lucas Veloso want to, to uh, have a, uh, elaborate a question but he, he had a problem with the microphone then I will read uh, the question he said okay. uh, thanks for the presentation I have seen proposal for citizens forums especially about the climate emergence, as mentioned by Rizek and colleagues, who seek to insert those who have not yet born in the claim climate debates. I would like to know how you evaluate the strength and limitations of such initiatives. This is uh, about climate, um, cl climate assemblies. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, I, I made a point of uh, spending a whole sort of slide on, on them. Um, I am quite impressed at the way in which uh, the, these climate assemblies can formulate consensus, consensus on some climate and social policies. Um, after all, they brought, the, the, the assemblies are, are made representative of all the major currents in, in, in the country, um, including those who are climate deniers and so forth. Um, and um, the, they're very extensive. Um, extra, I mean, they take, they take a lot of money and time. It takes about six to nine months. Uh, the, the convention, the assembly members meet every two or three weeks throughout this period. They're advised by a large number of experts and then they have to start formulating conclusions and policy conclusions on a whole range of proposals. So it's, it's, it's a, a very extensive um, um, pr uh, pr process that they have to go through. And um, it does seem that that at the end of that, there's very considerable consensus on some quite radical policies. For example, phasing out um, petrol cars by 2025. That's that's radical. Uh, and um, and the, now the one problem with them is that they are, they are just advisory and they have any necessary effect on policy. But in France, President Macron who was, I think, stung, and still is being stung, by the wave of uh, opposition from the Gilets Jeunes and similar protests, has said that he will enact all the proposals of the Convention without alteration. Now, I don't necessarily believe him, and I'm sure there'll be lots of backsliding on this, but um, this, if this is... Uh, if this happens to any great extent, this shows the way in which um, a citizens' assembly can then start to implement, uh, influence the policies of uh, a very big country. So I've got, uh, I'm watching it carefully to see what happens. Thank you. Uh, Gustavo Sabag. Can you hear me? Uh, my microphone is good. Yes. Hi, Professor. Yeah. 
Nice. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the excellent presentation and the excellent work you, you have done. Uh, the association you made between inequalities and the environmental problems uh, seems to me to give much credit to the Marxist spirit of capitalism, because it seems to me uh, they are both uh, consequences directly uh, of the inefficient uh, productive system we live in. That's the core of my question. I'd like to hear from you if you believe with it, and uh, I'd like to uh, to know if you uh, what do you think about these propositions? Do you think it is uh, that you you propose uh, some eco-social reforms, uh, even though we know that we have the principal players, the, the principal players of the world depend on the system and they have uh, much more power than the, the people ordinarily. That's something to debate, but I'd like to hear from you. If you believe yes. the, 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 the core of the problem is the, produ the inefficient productive system, we live in the capitalism, but, and you think we can't change that, so uh, you propose some social and uh, eco reforms that maybe we can attenuate this problem, or if you believe uh, this is uh, the, the core of the problem is the, the economic system, but you think we shouldn't change it and it, for, for many reasons, and you, you bet on the social reforms to change mm -hmm. that, or you, you don't think the, the core problem is the, 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 the capitalism, okay. the okay. productive system we live in, and, and uh, you think you, you really bet on social reforms. I'd like to, <laughs> do you understand what, I, what I'm trying I, to I do? understand perfectly, oh. yes. No, no, it's a very good question. And um, it's a big question. And uh, it's, it's the question of capitalism. Um, I'll, I'll try and do, answer this in, in a sort of, in, in a series of steps. I think capital, uh, the, the basic problem is capitalism. That, that's quite clear. Um, because capitalism forces growth uh, and um, it, it requires growth in order to, to maintain itself. Uh, and it, capitalism insinuates um, private production in a huge range of areas of life which are not really suited to it. It infiltrates into, into, the, into nature and it infiltrates into families and collective provision in ways which are harmful. That's just two ways in which capitalism is, is the problem. And inequality, um, which arises from capitalism, also makes it very difficult to deal with the climate issue. Um, there was a study which showed that if, um, if we relied simply on growth to pull everyone up um, above a poverty level in the world, the, the economy would have to expand for 15 times, which would completely destroy the planet. So there's a real tension there between social um, decency and uh, planetary and, and the survival of the planet. So it is the basic problem. But we have to deal with this problem very fast, in within 20 years or so. And I don't, I can't see capitalism ending in 20 years. So we, we have to work within this system, which is the core, basic cause of the problem, in order to deal with the problem. That is the dilemma we face. Now, it's not an entirely impossible task because um, there are sections of capital which clearly um, favour uh, decarbonisation. It, it's completely wrong to think that um, all, all of um, capitalism is, is like uh, the sort of groups which support Trump. Uh, that to think that the future lies in coal is stupid and, and, um, and, and in many areas of life um, the green economy, the green capitalist economy is growing fast, employment is growing fast in it and the brown economy is retreating and it will have to retreat further if there's a big uh, move, if there's a big fear of stranded assets that oil and coal will be stranded and um, that uh, st the stock values of those corporations will fall. Uh, 
So I, don't, I think there's, it's quite possible to envisage a green capitalism. But it is not so easy to envisage at all a fair or just green capitalism. The injustice would still re re remain. There's also the possibility of different varieties of capitalism. I mean, quite clearly, um, I've, I've been in several conferences and um, quite clearly the US is, is, is almost on its own. Or perhaps the, the US, Canada and Australia are very difficult countries to um, shift towards a green, a green New Deal approach. Um, and perhaps Brazil is as well. I must hear from you about that. Um, but there are other countries across Europe, Japan, uh, elsewhere, where um, there's a, a substantial shift towards towards green, greening and social justice greening. I think you can identify that. And even in China, there's a, a very substantial shift. So um, I'm not so pessimistic. Also, finance, big finance, seems to be getting behind um, the, the notion of a, a just transition uh, and uh, shifting money fairly fast out of oil and coal and into uh, renewables and uh, green industries. So that's my argument. We, the, the, the fundamental issue is capitalism, but I think there are roots uh, to modify capitalism, so it is a reformist structure I'm, uh, answer I'm putting forward, um, which can buy us some time. Does that answer it? Um, uh, Florencia, por favor. Mm. Thank you, Professor. That was a really interesting talk, uh, a really important topic. Uh, my question uh, regards the issue of migration. So one of the consequences of climate change is an increase in environmental motivated migration. Uh, there are people that talk about that in 2050, there will be like 200 million climate refugees. So a really large number of movement of people. And I feel that welfare states are really vulnerable to those sort of, of dynamics, because they are sometimes founded in a restricted notion of solidarity, uh, perhaps a racist notion of solidarity that you understand. You, you are able to feel uh, solidarity only with those that are close to you. Uh, I think that, for instance, uh, right wing movements feed on that and they, they create like uh, a complicated dynamic. So my question is if you think there are some sort of mechanisms that could be developed to account for this sort of dynamic or uh, like an institutional uh, mechanism or mm. do we need to resort to a societal normative change? That's, that's my question. Well, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> Let's look at this from the welfare state point of view, first of all. I mean, it's not surprising that um, solidar solidarity b begins at home. And it's, uh, it's easy to speak about ex extending solidarity from within country to global, but that's, that's going to take some time to happen. Um, in the meantime, um, I mean, there is one, uh, there is one counter argument, which is that uh, it's better to invest in in jobs and services in uh, developing countries than for people to move from developing countries to to work in the rich countries. I've, I've often, I've, well, in fact, I've always felt uncomfortable about huge numbers of, um, of African doctors and nurses and Asian doctors and nurses and Latin American who are working in Britain. I mean, a rich country, and we're sucking um, skilled labour out of these countries. This seems to me um, actually morally morally wrong, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I think there is an argument against uh, freeing up migration along those lines. Um, the corollary then must be a very substantial opposite shifting of funds, capital funds, from the rich countries to developing. 
uh, and that has to happen and that actually is being encouraged i think by the by the climate crisis and the recognition of um of how we we're all threatened by uh you know the, the, these 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 planetary um, planetary threats so um so that that's one argument i i would put forward that um it's i would stress more the counterflow of funds and investment rather than the inward flow of migration um i don't know what you think about that but uh, i think that case has to be made from a progressive point of view um uh, at the international level very little is being done on this there was a, a warsaw agreement about recompense for um climate migrants but the us and other countries didn't sign up to it and that was just on recompensing migrants who are affected by severe severe climate destruction of their livelihoods as for accom um, uh, accommodating migrants there's, there's no move on that as far as i can see at the national at the international level yet yes i think i i, I agree with you with the point that uh there is a discussion should be made from a pro progressive point of view of developing mechanisms to solve these problems in the country that these people are i think mm. it's you, you do it's difficult to do because of the racist sort of uh, label that's you know mm -hmm. it's difficult but um i've i've always felt uncomfortable about i mean the the philippines supplies a large number of nurses and doctors yet it is um you know it needs them itself <clears throat> Uh, please, does anyone else want to ask a question? If that's it, I'm happy to stop. My voice is giving away. <laughs> uh -huh. Then, uh, I oh, think yeah. that we can finish. Professor, once again, I thank you. You brought questions that are on the agenda of the day. More than that, they are urgent by nature. I hope that we will be able to move uh, towards change current trends and be able to curb this regress movement. And I hope to be able to meet you at the other opportunity in the not too distant future. It was yes. And I'd like to thank the people for those, those three questions and uh, do contact me if you want to follow up at all. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. See you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> bye bye. And Natalia, yes, let's stay in touch. Yeah.